Hello, um, I'm Kevin Rogers and I'm the Director of Reasonable Faith Adelaide. Um, tonight we have uh, Joshua Mead and he's going to present us a talk on the wonder of the seal. So I'll hand it over to you, Joshua. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming along. Uh, yeah, tonight I'm going to discuss the wonder of the cell, um, primarily focusing on um, a metabolic pathway of um, respiration. Okay, so just a quick overview. So to begin with, I'm going to do a quick recap and give a outline of the purpose of the talk, uh, followed by the overview of cell structure, um, eukaryotic cells. Then I'm going to go through some of the step-by-step -step, um, processes that are involved with uh, cell re uh, respiration. Um, so that consists of three main stages, which is glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and electron transport uh, chain. Uh, I'll then talk about some considerations when it comes to uh, irreducible complexity, uh, in particular of um, ATP synthase, which I'll discuss later. Um, and then I'll finish up with some concluding remarks. Okay, so the uh, purpose of this talk. Um, so I'll quick recap on the previous talks that I've done. So I've done, um, I've covered the uh, DNA replication and um, uh, gene um, uh, gene expression inside the nucleus of the cell. Uh, and I've dis uh, discussed um, sort of the theories uh, behind early Earth uh, origins of life. Um, so intelligent design, replication first, uh, and metabolism first. So tonight I'll be discussing a bit about metabolism, giving some context and some ideas. Uh, motivation of the talk and past reception of my talks um, on this theme uh, have been a bit of a mixed bag. So my motivation is that um, I think that um, everyone should have a, a, a interest in the origin of life. Uh, and I think that it is um, important that we understand as many sides to the story as we can so that we can make an informed decision um, and when people question us um, based on our worldview, we we have an answer that is reasonable um, and um, informed. My past reception, like I say, has been a mixed bag. Um, I've had anything from very positive feedback, uh, including, you know, people sending me a book after a talk. Um, he happens to be here tonight. Um, so that was very positive and, and kind. And then I've also had on the other end of the spectrum, I've had people walk out on me because um, I dared to present uh, some um, theories that were opposed, opposing their view and, and that uh, pulled an, an emotional response. So um, that's not what my intention is. I just want to try and be as fair uh, and unbiased as I can so that we get the truth, get to the bottom of the truth. Does that make sense? So... Yeah, so uh, also to give an overview of some of the processes that are under the umbrella of cell metabolism, so namely cellular respiration. I'm presenting from a layman's view on the topic, so I will present what I've learnt of the topic while also being open to either correction and or additional input as, um, as I go. So if you have a question that's burning on your tongue, um, or if I've if, I, if you believe I've, I've made a mistake somewhere along the lines, just feel free to interrupt me and I'll, I'll fix it or I'll discuss. Um, yeah, and, I, and feel free to stop me at any time if I need to clarify anything. I know there's quite a lot of um, diagrams and a lot of um, names of molecules and things like that. And so if, if, um, if you've forgotten what something is and you'd like me to clarify, um, feel free just to, to um, drop a question as you go, as I go. Um, and thirdly, uh, I'd like to be able to open up the discussion around uh, intelligent design, um, the claim that um, 
you know, of God of the gaps, which often our religious people get accused of, um, ir- uh, ir- irreducible complexity, and how Christians should respond to um, anti-science criticism. Okay, so just a quick recap on one of my previous talks. I went over uh, gene expression and uh, transcription. So the um, eukaryotic cell has got a, um, a nucleus, which houses all of your DNA, which is obviously your code for life. That DNA is transcribed by a set of molecules, and um, those that DNA basically is the manuscript that produces um, proteins. Uh, these proteins are made out of what they call amino acids, and um, and that's basically where I where I uh, wound up last time I was discussing in my last talk. So today I'm actually going to be listing a whole stack of proteins which are in the form of enzymes. So an enzyme is a type of protein. Um, and so this just kind of maps um, what the DNA actually directly um, relates to in terms of actually how it, um, uh, how, they, how the proteins that are produced from your DNA function within the cell and what they actually do. So this is the cell structure of a eukaryotic cell. Eukaryotic cell basically just means that it's got a, a nucleus and membrane uh, membrane bound organelles. So the the DNA in a typical animal cell like this or a human cell, uh, the DNA is held within the nucleus. Um, and then you've got all these extra organelles out here. I know what a good chunk of them do. I can't say that I know what all of them do. Um, I, I have at one stage in my life but <laughs> like I say I come at this from a bit of a layman's um, perspective so the um, in general the the one organelle that we're going to be honing in on tonight is the mitochondrion so that's the um, the blue the well I suppose a lot of it's blue but yeah the the, the blue ones there I'm scrolling my mouse across uh, which has got kind of like this um, inside sh um squiggly shape so they um, are passed off as the powerhouse of the cell kind of like little batteries they produce from sugar they produce energy so they break down sugar and they um, they extract as much energy out of it as they can you don't need mitochondrion to do that you can do it fairly inefficiently um, outside of the mitochondrion some cells actually don't have mitochondrion and they can still produce energy from sugar. It's just very inefficient. Okay. So uh, oxygen. Okay, so this is just kind of like a bit of a fun fact page. Um, between 30 and 180 seconds of oxygen deprivation, uh, you can lose consciousness. Uh, at the one minute mark, cells, uh, brain cells begin dying. At three minutes, new, uh, neurons suffer more extensive damage and lasting brain damage becomes more inevitable. Uh, five minutes, death becomes imminent. Ten minutes, even if the brain remains alive, a coma and long-lasting brain damage are almost irreversible. Oh, not inevitable, sorry. I'm trying to move my video stream here. Uh, yeah, and then so 15 minutes of old becomes nearly impossible. So the brain represents just 2% of a person's body weight, but it uses about 20% of the body's oxygen supply. Um, so, so what is the reason for this? So uh, the brain relies on glucose to power the, neutron, uh, uh, the, the neurons uh, that basically control the nervous system um, and control your mus muscular system and whatnot. Okay, so... Um, but why does it need the oxygen? So without the oxygen, the brain cells cannot metabolize glucose and therefore cannot uh, con convert glucose into energy. Uh, it's not only obviously brain cells, it's all the cells in your body, but the brain is just um, particularly heavy on the usage of um, sugar. Um, yeah, so that's basically that. So now I've said, so why do we rely so heavily on oxygen? probably something that people don't really think about you need oxygen from the time you um, you start breathing um, when you take your first breath until your last but 
you, you never really think about it until you, you look into it as to why do you actually need oxygen and what's um, what does it actually do. Okay, so that is the answer. Um, and that's the end of my talk. No. Um, <laughs> so this is the human uh, metab metabolism map. Uh, so metabolic map. Um, inside here, this is basically a bunch of catalytic pathways of different um, um, molecules of sorts. So you've got proteins, you've got DNA and RNA and how those nucleotides are produced. You've got carbohydrates, how they're broken down to produce energy. Um, you've got the, the, um, the manufacture of lipids. Uh, so there's all sorts of good stuff in here. And none of this actually includes the enzymes in between each process that actually catalyze these. So this is just the um, just the pathways of all these molecules that uh, are used inside your cell and metabolize basically. So the ones that we're going to be focusing on today is basically the carbohydrate coming down the central area here. Everything else is going to be outside of the scope of tonight's talk. But we're basically going to be taking glucose um, which is here, and we're going to be breaking it down into a couple of smaller molecules. So that's the first stage of respiration. Um, the second phase is the circular looking um, cycle here. That's called the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. And then the final stage is the electron transport chain, which is over here. So we're going to be covering a, a bunch of this. There's three main stages. So we're going to go through each stage sort of one by one. Um, and uh, and I'll discuss how it works. Okay, so before I do that, I'll explain what the, the end goal is. So this molecule here, ad uh, adenosine triphosphate, is um, the throw-off line of it is that it is the energy currency of the cell. And so if you've got lots of energy, uh, adenine, uh, well, they call it ATP. I'll call it ATP because it's much more simple. Um, then your body can use it to do the everyday functions inside your cells. So um, the um, the triphosphate part of this is these three phosphates here. So this is the third phosphate, and that third phosphate is the one that gets snapped off and a bunch of energy is released. So this adenine here is is a is a um, a nu nucleotide. Uh, so it's kind of like um. um like what your DNA is made out of. So it's got a sugar, a ribose sugar, um, and that's the adenine part, adenine group. So we've got adenine, um, ad, sorry, ad, adenosine, sorry, um, which has got the ribose backbone and then the triphosphate. So if you knock the third phosphate off, you've got diphosphate, and that's the low energy form of this molecule. So any time your body needs to do a process, um, uh, you basically spend this third phosphate group here. Okay, so um, so I've got a couple of facts here. Um, uh, energy currency. So uh, yeah, so basically here it just basically says. Um, as a result, cells within the human body depend on the hydrolysis of 100 to 150 moles of ATP per day to ensure proper functioning. So that's kind of how much we use each day. And a mole is a lot of molecules. <laughs> so I can't say how much that is in kilograms. Sorry. Okay, so here's just one example of where ATP might be used. So if you've got a cell membrane here, uh, this this is what cell membranes look like, like the cell wall often, um, and also the membrane around organs inside the cell, basically, or organelles, I should say, but basically cell organs. So it looks like this. It's, a, it's called a, um, a, a, a phospholipid layer. So in order to push, say, these unwanted sodium ions or to, say, pull in potassium ions, into or outside of this membrane, you would have to basically spend an ATP. And then that release of energy will allow this um, enzyme, or this port, um, 
is basically a protein which will allow things to come in or or leave through some sort of a um, active transportation mode. So usually that'll be against a gradient um, if if it requires um, active transport. Does it make sense? Okay, so um, generally speaking, ATP is produced inside this. This is the mitochondria that I was talking about before. Before it was blue and now it's orange. Um, no reason in particular for that. So um, mitochondria are kind of interesting organelles because they have their own DNA, um, which is quite fascinating. So they've got sort of this ring-type DNA, very similar to bacteria. They've also got their own ribosomes, which help to create, um, using the um, DNA, the ribosomes help to create all of the proteins and enzymes and all the building blocks of the cell. Um, they've also got this funny um, internal membrane. So there's a so it's got two membranes. It's got an outer membrane and an inner membrane. So the outer membrane contains porins that are proteins that control the flow of molecules in and out of the mitochondria. So porins is just like the, the protein that I showed you before. If I can just quickly scroll up like this, like a pore in there. So it controls the flow of stuff that we want in and out. <clears throat> um, inner membrane contains more than 150 different uh, polypeptides, um, or different types of polypeptides, and has a very high protein to phospholipid ratio. So phospholipids are the, um, are the little um, membrane molecules that I pointed at before. So that's a phospholipid here. And so to say that it's got um, a very high protein to phospholipid ratio basically means that it's just jam-packed full of protein. So it's, um, yeah, so about 15, pro uh, about one protein for every 15 phospholipid. So it's just packed. Okay. Um, so um, the current scientific understanding as per se uh, to, to play devil's advocate, advocate a bit here so uh, uh, endosymbiosis is what they they believe is how mitochondrion came to be uh, within a eukaryotic cell so uh, endosymbiosis is the concept of one cell engulfing another um, and both cells benefiting from the relationship so um, Lynn Mar uh, Margulis first made the case for endosymbiosis in the 1960s, and now it's fairly widely accepted uh, in the scientific community. Uh, so this is obviously a part of trying to um, work out in a natural means how uh, mitochondria may have come about. Uh, so there's a, a very simplified comparison here. Uh, where you've got a bacterium, which is a, um, a prokaryotic cell, which has just got its um, DNA in basically like a little uh, loop. Uh, and that's, I suppose, similar to how the mitochondrion DNA is. Um, and, and then we've got the reproduction of the bacterial reproduction is quite similar to how mitochondrial uh, will reprodu uh, reproduce as well. So um, these mitochondrion reproduce um, independently of cell reproduction. So cells will reproduce in their own way um, at their own time, uh, and mitochondrion just are completely um, separate. They just reproduce as needed. So it's kind of odd, and, and I'm not saying that it's uh, one way or the other designed or will come about by chance. Um, that being said, they currently have no chance of surviving outside of the cell. So if you were to take the mitochondrion and place it outside the cell, it would it would not survive. It would um, be suggested that they've lost that ability due to the cell taking up that sort of defensive function. Um, that's how the theory goes. Okay, so cell... Oops, sorry. I'm just trying to move. I, I might just minimize that. Cell respiration... So generally uh, aerobic uh, overview. So um, not all of this process is aerobic, but I've, I've sort of completed it with the aerobic um, part. So, so like I mentioned before, we've got three stages of cell respiration. Uh, so we've got 
um, glycolysis, which is the most simple, but kind of the most uh, the, the quickest. And that can be done um, in either in the presence of oxygen or without oxygen. So it doesn't actually require oxygen. Um, and then that that's independent of mitochondria. So that just occurs everywhere in the cell cytoplasm. So just within the cell goo, basically. Um, now, if there is oxygen present, then you can use some of the byproducts of glycolysis to then go into the stages two and three. And that is far more efficient and you can effectively extract um, more energy in the, in the form of ATP out from every single glucose molecule. So you've got one glucose molecule, um, sorry, one glucose molecule. And if you, if you just do the glycolysis, you get two ATP from it only. And that's where it ends. If you carry on through using the mitochondrion, you can extract another 34 odd ATP out of it. So um, very beneficial, but you can see here it requires oxygen in order to do it. If that makes sense. So, uh, another thing to yeah, um, so so I'll go through each of these three stages um, fairly briefly. So stage one glycolysis. So I'll just uh, so glycolysis is a pro uh, process by which glucose is converted through a series of enzyme uh, reactions, um, and it turns a six carbon molecule of glucose into two three carbon molecules. So basically, it splits it in half. Uh, so there's about 10 different stages of um, molecule which then gets um, changed slightly or broken and then changed slightly then broken uh, so it goes through about 10 stages in order to get there um, the initial stages require two atp to get it um, to get it started but then after the after the molecule is broken into half then we release four atp so we get two ATP, um, we net two ATP. Um, in rapidly contracting, say, muscle cells, for instance, with a uh, very high energy demand, we can, um, um, so very high energy demand, basically, uh, glycolysis is very fast. It's very inefficient, but it's very fast. And um, from what I've read, glycolysis is approximately 100 times faster at producing ATP than um, then stages two and three of respiration. So um, if you're a sprinter or something like that and you've got a, a, a high demand for energy very quickly, then your body will scrap <laughs> as much as it needs to the stages two and three and it'll just, it'll just use glycolysis to burn as much um, sugar as possible, which makes sense. Um, in the absence of oxygen, the byproduct here, which is kind of a high energy byproduct, NADH that's used in stages two and three. If you don't have oxygen, that byproduct actually becomes um, it, it, that byproduct latches to the second byproduct here, pyruvate, which is a three carbon molecule, and it creates lactic acid, which has to be taken away by the blood. So, um, so that's why you got sore legs after you've had to sprint because um, because glycolysis has been going. Um, um, over time, and um, and it's built up all of this lactic acid because you can't get rid of the pyruvates and you can't get rid of these other molecules here, so they join together, and they make lactic acid. So this is the actual pathway here. Um, so, like I say, we've got our six carbon structure, which is glucose, and these are all of the different enzymes which as i said at the start was different proteins so all of these enzymes are coded for in your dna so each of these stages here is another enzyme so um so the first thing we do is a um the first enzyme slaps one of these phosphates onto this glucose so remember when i said it takes an atp that's because that third phosphate that i was talking about with the ATP structure, that third phosphate gets um, slapped onto the glucose. And then the second ATP that I said we use also gets slapped onto the other side. Um, and these are the um, enzymes here basically just rearrange the structure a little bit so that, you know, as it goes stage by stage. 
Now, once the split happens here, then you sort of get some payoff. payoff. Um, you get the four ATP back. Now, what's amazing about these enzymes here is that they're not just, they don't just do the one simple um, function. They don't just take, say, uh, the molecule and snap it, or they don't just take the molecule and, and slap a, a phosphate onto the side of it. They also have other regions on the enzyme that inhibit or, uh, or they basically regulate it. So, um, so for instance, in the presence of lots of um, glucose, um, um, some of these enzymes will um, be, uh, it will recognize the glucose in some other sites and it'll actually um, um, regulate it so that uh, all of these processes happen a lot faster. So it actually changes the shape of the enzyme so that they either work more effectively or less effectively. So, the, uh, so there's allosteric regulators, which basically uses um, all of the um, molecules that are already hanging around to indicate how much we need to um, uh, how much we need to uh, process. You know, in terms of how much we want to inhibit or um, enhance these. Enzymes, so they're very sophisticated enzymes. Josh, can That's I interrupt, it. please? Yeah. Um, those uh, enzymes on the right, are they yes. inputs or outputs, or do they just have to be present to facilitate? They just have to be present. So, right. so, so, okay. So, so, I'll quickly explain. So, the hexokinase, for instance, um, which, uh, so that the kinase is the the giveaway there. That is what um gives the phosphate group so it actually um, um anything that's got the kinase there either gives or takes away and gives to something else a phosphate group so we've got kinase over here um and we've got another one down here pyruvate kinase so you can see um down here the phosphate group has been lost because it's a kinase it's given it to an AT, an adp so that phosphate group there got um got added to an ADP to enhance it to the ATP, which is the high energy one. So anything with kinase, it's mucking around with these phosphate groups here. Anything with a um isomerase is just changing the shape of the molecule. So the enzyme's just got to be present and it'll it'll change the shape of it. Um, um and and the other ones do other stuff. Too. <laughs> the other, the other, yeah, mutase is also the same. Mutase basically change, changes the configuration as well. So there's sort of giveaways as to what they actually do. So that's the allosteric regulators. So that's kind of just using what's already there, and it's enhancing or, or inhibiting um, these processes by changing the shapes of these slightly, and it um, it all seems to just work perfect. Um, kind of like a puzzle. Uh, there's also hormonal regulators, so you would have heard of insulin. Insulin is um, insulin goes into the nucleus of the um, of the cell, and it will say stimulate the pro uh, the production of all of these. So if there's if some of these are missing, or if we're low, if we're building up any of these because we we've got a shortage of some of these enzymes insulin's job is basically to go into the nucleus of the cell and to say hey we're short on these particular um, enzymes uh, because we're not catalyzing these reactions fast enough and then your body will basically produce well your nucleus your your dna will then um, be used to make more basically uh, so that's uh, pretty cool and glu uh, glucagon is the opposite so insulin um, stimulates it and glucagon says hey we've got too much of this stuff stop producing it for a while so that's uh, yeah so that's that so so these like I said these pyruvates here they will become lactic acid if, if they got nowhere to go after this so they're half a glucose molecule basically okay so um, so just put piecing it back together. I'm just going to show the overview again. So now we've got these um, two NADHs, which is just high energy molecules, and we've got two ATP. That's what we've, we've gained so far. 
plus our two pyruvates, which then go on to the next stage. Okay, so these two pyruvates have come through uh, into our second stage, which is called the uh, citric acid cycle, um, also called the Krebs cycle. Uh, so through a series of reactions, basically the first reaction, it pops off one of these carbons, um, which also releases another one of these high energy molecules. Don't worry about these ones for now. They're used in the last, uh, the third phase, uh, th well, sorry, third stage of respiration. So these here at the moment, all you need to know is that um, they're basically electron carriers. So they carry spare electrons. So anything... Uh, these yellow ones that you you won't recognize, they just carry extra electrons. As you're popping the carbons off, you get these um, spare electrons. Um, so when you, as you go around this cycle here, um, it joins with a four carbon. So a four carbons are at the end of the cycle. So it gets to two carbons plus the four carbons, makes a six carbon molecule here, which is called citric acid. The citric acid then goes around this loop and it gets, carbons get popped off it and you get all this energy come out of that. It's kind of like burning car, uh, burning um, uh, a hydrocarbon in air. You, you, know, you can imagine it like it's a bit like a combustion, but it's a chemical combustion. And so you're breaking this molecule down. It starts as a six, and it gets back down to a four. And then you add another one, and then it pops back up to six, and it burns it out, and it becomes four. So it's kind of like a, it's a cycle. And it, it goes from six carbons down to four carbons. And this is about, uh, I think it's an eight stage process where it's either changing the shape of the molecule or, 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 or knocking a carbon off. And so we get some ATP, which is just our straight currency, but we also get something that we can cash in later. So this goes hand how fast in. It take, how quickly it takes to uh, complete a cycle. Oh, I don't know in terms of time, but I know this is far less, far more timely than what, um, than glycolysis. But I, I don't actually know how far. This, this will still be very fast because you, your body. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't tell you what the revs are, <laughs> unfortunately. But yeah, the, the, the take home is, is that we're feeding in two carbons. And so it gets knocked up to six carbons, and then those two carbons basically get knocked back down, knocked out the other side, and we're back down to four, six, four, yeah. Um, and and we get a and we get a bunch of energy as a um coming out of them. So stage three is is kind of the most uh, complex one, and it's where you get to cash in all those um other molecules that we've uh, we've energized. So uh, just reading here, so the NADH and the FADH, which we saw in the previous stages, um, uh, I should say actually here, that's also from glycolysis. There is some NADH from glycolysis, my apologies. So NADH and FADH from the citric acid cycle and glycolysis, um, they pass electrons onto a series of complex protein structures. So they, they pass the electrons onto these structures here. Um, now, this structure here is actually inside this in, in a, in a um, membrane of those mitochondria. So we've got the this, this blue part is outside of the mitochondria, but still inside the cell. So it's inside the cell, but it's, it's, it's the, the goo inside the cell is the, is the blue. Then we've got just inside the first, the outside skin or membrane of the mitochondria is the red. And then you've got that squiggly bit on the inside is the yellow. So this is inside the, the second membrane inside the mitochondria. Now, these high energy um, molecules basically drop off electrons into these. These are um, uh, protein complexes, so they're quite sophisticated. And what happens when they, they become energized, they actually push a proton out into the space here so they're making actually an electric potential um, and these electrons then get passed on through some other little molecules to the next one which also pumps a proton out then the electron travels along through the membrane again and then it gets to the to the um, well the fourth complex here and it also pumps another hydrogen ion or a proton out so so from one nadh we can we can actually get three hydrogen ions pumped out into this space here. 
and FADH only does two. It's not quite as um, energized, but it's still uh, you can still get two from the FADH. So you're sort of milking uh, these um, high energized molecules for for the basically the energy through the use of um, the, uh, this electron transport chain. <clears throat> so the final receiver of these electrons um, is actually oxygen. So inside complex four, um, it basically pairs with an oxygen molecule and you produce water. So that's why you need the oxygen that you breathe because it, it's, it's in the final stage of this electron transport chain um, and it accepts those low energy electrons because they've sort of been um, they've been taken to a lower energy, low energy state, if that makes sense. So, so now what's the result of this? So for each NADH, we've got three protons have been pumped across that uh, membrane. And for each FADH, we've got two protons pumped across that membrane. Um, so what does that mean? So with now, with one glucose molecule, we get... Um, so we've got the two NADH, so that's six hydrogen ions pumped from the glycolysis, and we also get um, 28 hydrogen ions pumped from what uh, from the byproducts of the Krebs cycle. So we get an additional 34 um, ATP um, from this electron transport chain because each of those hydrogen ions will result in a, a production of one ATP. And how does that happen? So at the final... Um, complex here is called ATP synthase, sometimes called complex 5. Um, but this is a sophisticated protein that effectively has got a, a motor, uh, an electric motor basically, and a um, catalytic head. And that catalytic head will turn when the motor turns and it'll, it'll crush um, the diphosphate, the 2-phosphate um, adenine diphosphate and it'll crush it with a phos uh, with a phosphate and it'll produce adenine triphosphate so effectively um, you're creating ATP in a mechanical way which has got a slightly different name um, than just doing it in a chemical way so it actually physically pushes them together um, so another way of looking at it so this is um, this is complex as one to four all just shown in one. So here we've got the, the the large amount of hydrogen ions flowing through. So that's a, a, a broken down version of all four of these. And then we've got a more detailed um, image of what this um, ATP synthase looks like. So you've got all of our uh, positive hydrogen ions out the out here in the in a membrane space. Um, they push through. Um, a port here, and then they spin it, they spin this motor, and then they fly out here. So uh, very much resembles an electric motor. Now while it spins this, you have a crushing action going on here. So this shaft here is asymmetrical. So you think of like say your finger on a bit of a tilt. As it turns, it actually um, moves all of these. Um, proteins, it configures them in different ways that it exposes active sites um, and then the molecules go in and then as it moves around further it crushes it um, and the and like I say for each hydrogen ion you get one ATP out so it's very efficient um, and like I say you get about another 34 ATP just from this sort of final cash in of all of these extra molecules um, now that's the uh, the view of the um, ATP synthase in terms of a di uh, diagram. So you can see here you've got your hydrogen ions coming in, spinning the rotor. You've got a a stator here. Uh, so you got the um, like a backbone, and you got um, here's the catalytic head here where you've got your ATP coming out and your products coming in. Um, and the, 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 the name of that, if anyone wants to know the buzzword, is oxidative phosphorylation. So phosphorylation is just basically the addition of the um, inorganic phosphate here. So phosphorylation is just it's been added to another um, 
um, molecule. So phosphorylation is just as had that added to it. Um, and oxidative, oxidative because it's from the electron uh, transport chain. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, and one more note. So that's that's kind of more of a, a an actual diagram as to what it would actually look like in terms of the. Um, these are the protein strands. Uh, the proteins are just lines of amino acids that fold and contort and um, do stuff. So that's what you'd actually be looking at in terms of more of a realistic image. Uh, so here's a here's kind of like a little video of what it would actually look like. So you've got your um, your motor turning at the top here, um, and it moves all of these um, um, all of these protein um, blocks to actually do the um, the catalyzing of the ATP or phosphorylation, should I say. Okay, so um, so more of the controversial take. Um, so looking up as to how some of these could have come about by chance, um, I couldn't find a whole lot of information on it, but the sort of the, the best thing I could come up with is how um, ATP, ATP synthase con, uh, is composed of, of basically kind of two subunits or two main structures. You've got your, 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 your motor down the bottom and you've got a catalytic head at the top and they're sort of held by these extra extra um, structures. Um, now the as the theory basically goes is that this um, bottom half where it's sitting inside the membrane is very similar to a flagellum motor um, that also sits inside a cell membrane. This sits inside uh, the same sort of membrane. Uh, and so uh, as the argument goes, if something like the, the rotor has already um, come about, uh, then that information is all there. Um, yeah, so, so I say here, the two rotors share a very similar form and make uh, therefore considered to be a possible pathway for um, uh, this to sort of come about without um, yeah, too many intermediates. <laughs> And then for the top subunit, um, the, 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 the closest comparison that I've sort of come across is the DNA helicase, which is where they believe um, um, if the, so the DNA helicase is to do with um, unwinding DNA. Um, that also uses ATP uh, in order to unwind DNA. So ATP is used in the, in the unwinding process. Um, and so it's kind of just a reverse um, using uh, the same active sites as what uh, this catalytic head here is, except instead of um, using ATP, which is what the helicase does, it would be creating ATP. So, but it's kind of very similar in terms of just running it in reverse. So that's as the theory goes. Um, so... Uh, concluding remarks, sorry, that possibly dragged on a little bit, but uh, first of all, thank you for taking your time out of your evening. I appreciate your time. Uh, I believe it is valuable, valuable to apologetics to learn about all of the views, whether they be opposing to what uh, your worldview is or not, um, and what the evidence they have to support their claims. Um, I've got some closing questions, maybe just to think about, or we can discuss, or um, whatever. Um, this is uh, more of how as Christians we should view these things. Uh, what should our stance be towards the origin of life uh, debate as Christians? Um, what are what's people's views on the sort of the irreducible complexity versus the God of the gaps? Um, because it seems to be uh, whenever you say something's irreducibly complex, they it's sort of God of the gaps is the the one line that you'll basically hear straight away and they think that that's end of discussion uh, and the third point that sort of I'd like to raise is why does this debate often cause kind of like an emotional response like we um, 
wear our emotions on our sleeve quite often with these sorts of things. Um, and um, whether that's reasonable, do we do we do we feel like we need to sort of defend God in in a, in a sense, you know? Or, um, yeah, if that makes sense, because I I know definitely in the past it's brought up quite a few emotional responses. So yeah, so uh, well, thank you everyone for your time. Um, and I hope that was somewhat informative. Um, and I tried to be um, kind of as unbiased as I could in the sense. Uh, don't, well, know if I, uh, don't know if that worked very well, but yeah. <laughs> um, Joshua, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I've been through this talk several times with Josh as we're kind of leading up to it to try and clarify it. And it made a lot more sense tonight than what I did before. <laughs> So I finally understand it. Oh, very good. <laughs> to a large <laughs> third time, lucky. <laughs> yeah. So, um, um, so it's an extremely uh, complex topic. So, um, uh, I think anybody could be forgiven if there's a uh, a lot of gaps in um, understanding, especially with all the terms. But yeah. uh, I think you've done a reasonably good job of uh, giving a simple pre presentation of a very complex topic. Oh, um, we'll leave the. Um, you in um, share screen mode uh, yeah. so that initially we can have a look at the questions that you've actually raised. Sure. So these questions are not just to you, are they? Um, no, no, no. That's sort they're, of, they're um, questions to the audience. Uh, so um, um, so uh, I'd like the audience or the participants to consider uh, Josh's questions that are here. Um, so, uh, what should our stance be towards origin of life as Christians say? Uh, Definitely in favour. Definitely in favour. To, 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 clarif <laughs> to clarify, you know, like, um, um, you know, a, a lot of people are, are very strictly, say, six day creation, and a lot of people are, don't take such a hard line on that sort of thing. Um, so, so it, it's, uh, you know, and I, and I know a lot of people get quite emotional or quite defensive about that as well. Um, you know, do we do we kind of um take evidences for what? It, I mean, obviously, I don't I don't think I I um presented anything that was strongly evidential against a a intelligent design tonight. Um, uh, I'm sure it goes deeper than what I was able to pull up. You know, um. A lot of stuff was kind of over my head, <laughs> to be to be entirely honest. Um, so yeah, if that. Uh, yeah, well, um, I'd, I'd just like to um, question Tom on his initial uh, comment. Um, you said you should be strongly in favour. What are you in favour of, Tom? Oh, I'm in favour of the origin of life. I think mm. it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, but why? <laughs> Look at all the trouble it's caused. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah well, well, there is that, but the but, but, but the opposite was probably pretty boring, right? Yeah. Well, someone that's so fond of AI, I'm surprised that you just um, yeah, you know, you you might have been keen just to see <laughs> AI take uh, see how much better they would have done. Hmm. Well, that's uh, that's a that's a very long conversation, Josh. <laughs> yeah, something that I've given quite a bit of thought, actually. Mm. Well, look, Josh, can I thank you? That was a very complex, and I think you did a very good job of bringing out all the interactions that occur in the cell. So well, I thought that was very good and well explained. Um, but I, as you said yourself, I, I don't think you've come down, from what you've explained, you've not come down really solidly one way or the other, whether this just happened spontaneously with a series of accidents or whether this was designed. I think you could be neutral on that from what you presented us today. Uh, well, I, 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 I tried to be. I mean, I know, yeah. it, like, um, you know, all the sources that I watch, you know, um, they're all very much like, um, on the opinion that, you know, they would they would present, yeah, you know, similar things to what I presented, but they would say, you know, many people think this is irreducibly complex, um, and basically, um, saying how ridiculous that is, you know, how ridiculous it sounds to even suggest such things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and so it's 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 a very odd topic to to sort of delve into because you know when you when I I say well why why does it seem so unre unreasonable you know mm -hmm. um, I think the point of the irreducibly 
complex, uh, irreducible uh, complexity argument is to, to say that uh, gaps exist and, and the pathway is not continuous. Mm. So there are uh, jumps. So how yes. can you jump from uh, the pieces in a mouse trap to a mouse trap? Well, yes. Yeah, so to, to answer to that, so this is kind of why they take this route here is that they would say, well, this bottom half is effectively already encoded yeah. in your DNA and so is the top half. And so really all you need to do is connect, have the, connect them together and you've got a functioning um and be, and because there's about um, there's there's a number of, of slight variations to this, they would say it doesn't have to be exact. There's a number of slight variations, like there's some of these that run in reverse, for instance. So it uses ATP to push protons out, mm. and so it's like running a motor in reverse as a pump instead. Um, and so, and, and but there's also slightly different variations of those different configurations, and so they would say, well, it doesn't have to be that exact. Um, that explanation reminds me a lot of the idea of saying it's easy to build a car. You just take a car body and a car engine and put them together. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And this is a whole lot more complicated than a car. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah so uh, it, even if the, you can actually spot an, uh, uh, um, a continuous pathway, it doesn't mean it's not designed. Mm. No, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Can I make a comment on the history of this origin of life? Yes. Um, up until Louis Pasteur, everybody believed that life just happened spontaneously because you, you left a piece of meat out on the ground or dropped any food around, all sorts of life forms formed on top of it. Absolutely. And Louis Pasteur, was the, with his pasteurization process, was the first person to show that if you sterilise this block puddle of material, then no life forms. So that was the first time the question of what is life came came up. Yes. So up to Charles Darwin and everybody in mid 19th century, origin of life was something that just happened all the time. And when I started medical school in 63, in first year chemistry, we had carbon chemistry, organic chemistry. Second year, we had biochemistry, and that was complicated enough. And some of the bits like Krebs cycles you've mentioned there have come in since then uh, uh, at that time. Mm. But after that, it developed into molecular biology, which is this massive complexity, which you've shown with your diagrams and the interactions there, which is vastly more complicated in each step than anything we ever understood in the 60s Definitely. and the continuous interaction of the whole complexity of all these cycles is just amazing mm -hmm. agreed yeah one of the comments i put uh, earlier on in the talk was that this effectively blows out of the water the whole concept of a simple cell yeah it's which we hear about so often <laughs> yeah well darwin thought it was a blob of jelly yeah to, to, answer your, to answer the question from Stephen, the mitochondria are used uh, to trace ancestry down the female line because yeah. they, they're not passed. So you don't get, you don't inherit any mitochondrial DNA from your father because it just stays within the. It will just be. It will be within the egg cell. It will not be within the sperm cell. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the other, yeah, but it, the it, other it, thing with Louis Pasteur was that he set up an experiment which is still running in his laboratory in Paris of completely sterilizing fully organic material and then keeping it at a nice temperature, but uh, in a tube, in a glass bottle, which had a tube running off, which stopped anything coming back in. And that experiment has been running for, well, what, 150 years now. And there's no signs of anything of life developing in there. Hmm. Uh, um, so, so how long do you say they've been running that for? Well, about 150 years. Hmm. I mean, that to, to, I mean, like I, I can't imagine that um, that would be like to play devil's advocate. Um, we're talking. 
um, a lot more uh, time than that, as well as a lot more, uh, far more environmental. Um, mm. uh, yeah, the point was that way back then they believed that it could happen in a matter of days at most. Mm. Well, I think it is accepted now that um, unless you can uh, uh, have a spontaneous generation of cells in our current time, that uh, it just doesn't happen. That Pasteur was right. Uh, kind of, kind of the, <clears throat> like the 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 thing I often see, which which does a disservice to Christians, is I see a lot of people say like, I don't, I never see a dog give birth to a cat. Um, and I, I sort of see that sort of thing all the time, and um, I, I don't think that kind of comment is helpful for um, <clears throat> the view of Christians in the scientific community. Because, like, I, I mean, I watch way too many debates, and I hear that sort of thing all the time, um, and it's kind of making it sound like they're claiming something that. Not, I mean, they they never claim that dogs give birth to cats. They say that dogs give birth to dogs with very slightly different DNA. Um, and you'd never see a change over the space of even, a, you know, three or four generations necessarily, or whatever this is the case. Um, but uh, like, like for like for that um, example of 150 years, like they don't really claim that it happens over the 150 years. So it's kind of putting putting words in their mouth in a sense. Um, yeah, but if I may, please, Josh. Uh, you know, I'm quoting. We do look at people who are more expert than most of us. I think it was the curator of the British Natural Museum back in about uh, 1990-ish anyway, said there was very little evidence for any um, transition forms between the different species mm. uh, or different gen genus anyway. And this is a guy, you know, I'm not talking about my own views or a Christian, you know, fundamentalist view. I'm talking about a guy who was there right at the top of the British History Museum, he said there is little, if any, evidence for um, the inter, you know, the the transition between different genuses. Mm. There's nothing there. The missing links are just not there or not clearly yeah. in evidence. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I can't really talk to that one because I don't really know a lot about the no. fossil record yeah. and how no. much of it I trust anyway um, yeah. because a lot of things have been fabricated in the past, so you never know how much of it is still being... And I... And I Thank you for mentioning the micron deal because it, well, it goes back quite a few years now. I've shared it with Trevor Harris too. Um, the Max Planck Institute for Biological uh, uh, Evolution, I think it's its full title, back in about 2012 did a study, about 300 samples of microbial DNA between, uh, I think it was Southern India, Papua New Guinea, and the Australian Aborigines and came up with about 11% commonality. Nine that we can actually measure the rate at which microchondrial DNA diverges as it goes yeah. past down generation. They came up with a figure of 4,280 years ago. There was a major interaction between Australian Aborigines, uh, people from the Indian subcontinent, and also from uh, Papua New Guinea. And it seemed to trace the link that the Australian Aborigines had indeed come down from uh, the subcontinent about that time frame. Um, yeah. Now, to me, as a as a believer, and I do the sums in Matthew chapter, uh, sorry, not Matthew, Genesis chapter eleven. That's an amazing approximation to uh, about the time of the Tower of Babel. Uh, and indeed, this is where we don't often hear that microcardial DNA matches has a different time frame from way our average carbon dating. Uh, there are they are in contradiction. The microcardial DNA actually gives a shorter time frame for historical events uh, than we see typically quoted from um, uh, radio, um, the carbon dating. Radio metric dating whatever. So you'd question whether uh, the Aborigines have been here for 65,000 years then? Well, that, I mean, that's, well, I don't know. How did they work out that? I guess they go to the caves and oh, take a sample of the rocks. Well, they don't work it out. Uh, anthropologists do, but... Uh, yeah. And, and indeed, that is thing. one of the comments. This comes from a secular. I think it was Nature that actually quoted the study from this German um, um, evolutionary biology um, department. Said, "Yeah, this so this this is actually remarkable, given that we've said they've been isolated for you know many thousands and thousands of years. Mm. And it looks like they actually had a major interaction. They didn't use the word 
what I did, uh, the link the Bible, they just said it looks like it was a major interaction 4,250 years ago. Yeah. Uh, but getting back to Josh's original question, what should our stance be towards origin of life? Uh, my own um, version is we should be very cautious before we become dogmatic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because um, who knows the mind of God? And do we know the way that God has actually done these yeah. things? Yeah, yeah. So well, I think we should tread carefully and not make assertions where we don't actually know. Well, you know, and again, I quoted, what, six months ago, um, Richard Dawkins himself was challenged on the um, hemoglobin module. Uh, uh, it's hemoglobin molecule and uh someone said and he said no this just didn't happen by chance it must have been crashingly obvious i think was the exact uh, emphasis he used that the hemoglobin module did not just happen by um series of um chances it, it was actually some sort of directed design directed he didn't use the word design but directed ev um, evolution and once you use directed it means that someone was you know making sure that things happened the right way Mm. That's Richard Dawkins. Yeah, yeah, he's got himself in trouble on other issues like yeah, Well, I really appreciate Richard Lennox. Um, no, Dave, John Lennox. John Lennox. John Lennox. John Lennox. Yeah, for yeah. Um, yeah, looking into what people have actually said. Yeah. Um, now, what are your views on irreducible complexity and God of the gaps? Um, are, they, are they really kind of related issues or separate issues? I well, I believe they're related because. As soon as irreducible complexity is, is you're finding yeah. the gaps, yeah. And God of the gaps is saying, well, you know, there is a pathway to it. Uh, well, sorry, so there's no the God pathway of the gaps to it, so God saying, must fill the gap. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And and so, um, I I, I think they go hand in hand. If I understand. Right. Them. Okay. So now that we understand the question, what are people's views? What's your views on irreducible complexity? Or well, first up, the, the early gap. scientists, when they're looking at science, were not looking uh, for gaps that they could put God into. They believed God was in everything. Mm. And the gaps were just gaps in our knowledge as we learned about what God had done and how God had done things. Um, yeah. So from that perspective, there is no such thing as a God of the gaps. So um, when I say God of the gaps, I mean that's a very common argument. Yes, it is. That it's a very common catchphrase that any atheist in, in a... In a um, debate of this type will always use as soon as you bring up anything um of complexity or yeah. or well, like complexity. you say we don't have a, a scientific explanation for the origin of the universe therefore god did it yes Whereas, or even you know insert god into every single bit that seems like it's too hard for a natural process and um and and it's a very simplified uh, it, it, the the thing that irks me i suppose is i watch a lot of debates and and all that sort of stuff and 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 it just seems to be like god of the gaps is a, is a one hit phrase that they they just key off to anything if you're trying to say well you know how can how can some of these things just arise through pure odds you know mm -hmm. um and it's like it's uh, the one hit a quitter the god of the gaps and that's that's the end of end of discussion but there's the equivalent uh, argument along the atheist line. It is, we currently don't know, but one day we will find out. Yeah. That, that's a belief in progressivism. I'm going to talk yeah, about yeah. that next week. Yeah, but you can use Science that of the gaps. To, yeah, you can use that to explain anything, and so it explains nothing. Nothing, yeah. Mm. I'm not sure that's a logical statement. but <laughs> I've heard it. Yeah, I've, yeah be, because you can always say that about anything. So it's a, I, it's a, a free kick. Um, if I could just point out from a novice point of view, um, Josh, it's actually beyond complex, all right? Um, it's not just complex, uh, what oh, you yeah. described. Um, you're talking about systems coming um, about simultaneously in order for everything to function. Mm -hmm. So um, rather than saying it's a god of the gaps, it to me it points to intelligent design. Right? Now so it's yes, yeah, so 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 the god of the gap is is saying that the gap is um there's there's no pathway in order to, to achieve this. So so for instance, yeah. like the the whole me, uh, metabolism thing, like some 
cells only use glycolysis because it's kind of simple. There's about 10 or so enzymes associated with it mm. um, and you pull out the AT ATP from it. That being said, you have to invest too and it's not until you get about to the sixth enzyme that you actually start harvesting the ATP out of it. So, you know. But you've got other systems that have to be working at the same time. Of course, you. yeah. So to me, to me, it's not just complex. They're complex individually, but then they also simultaneously have to be working in order for any of them. They can't or, or they, they're not autonomous on their own. They don't function no. on their own. So... From an OS point of view, if I was explaining, I'd just say, well, there it points to design, like we design something, like a computer, it just doesn't happen. Someone has to, you give it to me, a computer, parts, I wouldn't know what the heck, how to put it together. Someone who knows it's got some knowledge has to put it together. Yeah, yeah. so, 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 um, to a lot of very intelligent people conclude that um, design is an illusion and that there are simple pathways to get to these points. So um, mm. that's that's the part that I find like very, you know, people that are more intelligent than me um, um, uh, are quite comfortable in saying that um, there's there's pathways that lead to all of these things. So so I mean that's just something that I just want to point out is that um it seems very obvious that it is designed and yet they would yeah. say there's the illusion of design just because it looks complex um doesn't necessarily mean that it was designed complex. The point is if we assume as a basic principle of everything that there is no such thing as God, the naturalistic universe is all there is, then you have to. that has to be the case. Yeah. Um, so ignore all evidence to the contrary because we believe what we want to believe and that's it. Um, the God, whole God of the gaps thing is basically saying that all evidence to the existence of God is proof that God does not exist, which is basically yeah. a nonsense, but that's basically what it means. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. All right, let's move on. Uh, why does this debate cause an emotional response? because it does imply the existence of God and some people don't want to believe in God. Hmm. But there are also differences amongst Christians, which also cause an emotional yeah. response as well. Yeah. yeah, it's threatening people's worldview. And yeah. increasingly our worldviews are tied to our value. Mm. And, um, and then it's an implicit uh it's an implicit threat to our to our worldview and then our, our value. Um, uh, whether you're secular, um, whether you're uh, that would go, I think, to um, also uh, various interpretations of Genesis. So I think um, I think they're the reasons because it goes to the core of uh, worldview. So, like, um, I work for um, exclusive brethren, um, and they are an interesting crowd to work for <laughs> um they uh but they're very kind people yeah. um but uh for instance they even if they maybe don't um necessarily believe what they um even if some things seem a little bit crazy maybe in their mind the the cost of going against it uh, is too uh, sort of not a, not a, what they're willing to take, um, and and I think it's oh, it's po probably a bad example, but um, I sort of feel like the mindset is I don't want to, I don't even really want to listen to anywhere that the evidence takes me because I'm kind of comfortable mm -hmm. in my own views on things. You know, like for instance, okay, so for me. Um, I definitely would have considered myself an, a young earth creationist all my life. And, and I don't know where I stand on that at the moment, but to be honest, it doesn't really bother me. But once upon a time, it would have to ever think that um, I was comfortable with saying, well, God could have done it over a longer time. Uh, it would have meant that, oh, I can't take the Bible in its purest form as, as um, 
at, you know, as face value, that would have once upon a time have um, spooked me. Um, you know, I don't know. I I don't know enough about the the, the subject to make any uh, decisions, but I definitely, I've come to not feel like it's a make or break for my faith, mm. either which way. Because if it's one way, okay, that's how God did it. If it's the other way, well, that's fine. That's how God did it. It's just not going to make or break my emotions, as maybe it once would have. So, um, uh. So, so I, mean, I, I sort of know the answer to the questions that I've asked, but I, I like to bring <laughs> up the the thought process, I suppose, in a sense. Um, yeah. Why should it? Why should it um, cause an emotional response? Do you feel like you're losing a part of something if uh, if what you believe is is possibly a bit wrong? I, I, I just I watched a, um, a few good men recently, and I like the line: "You can't handle the truth." A very um, popular line. Yeah, yeah but, uh, because uh, quite often uh, uh, to actually accept the truth is hard and it will cost you. And so um, mm. we choose the path mm. where we get acceptance rather than truth. Yep. And, um, yeah, so it says the way is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. Yeah. Mm. I think that last question there is a very difficult one because first we have to um, concentrate on why does anything cause an emotional response? And mm. what, what is emotional response and why does it happen? And then once we've got that worked out, which is obviously a huge subject in its own right, uh, we can then look at what is this debate often caused an emotional response? Mm. Mm. Like, do we feel like we need to defend God's honour in terms of the Bible being, um, um, you know, true at all? In, in a study? sense, we do, because well, among other things, Jesus said, talked about people who uh, deny me before men, I will deny before the Father. Um, mm. So it's a matter of, um, are you prepared to stand up for what you believe to be true or not? Mm. Yes. So so is it what you believe to be true or, 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 or like, okay, so so um, I suppose a, a prime example is, say, Flat Earth Movement. Okay, so they, they believe that what they, they believe Flat Earth is biblical and and they really make Christians look very foolish online um, because they 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 really do. They every single piece of evidence that goes against them is just the science scientific community lying. It's false data. It's fabricated it's CGI and all these sorts of they, they carry on like they you know they they're a, a handful, but um but they take the they take the bible very literal in the sense and they will not be told otherwise and so they will take bits of science that they like and they will discard the rest and so so to how much can we take bits of science that we like and discard the rest i don't know where we sit on that spectrum you like the age of the earth mm. do we say well that's nonsense or do we say okay well maybe we need to um consider that and how that works in with our faith and what that means and and you know are they right or are they interpreting it in a way because they want the earth to be old or you know whatever whatever be the case but and when we talk about science what we're going to accept what we're going to throw out um something that everyone including the most strict scientists have to bear in mind is that science is never totally settled once upon a time everybody believed in the ether until yes. the famous michael somali experiment proved that there's no such thing Mm. Um, then we had to totally rejig our science, and it wasn't until Einstein came along that he was able to put that in perspective. Mm. Um, so, science as such is not the hard and fast absolute truth. It's just our interpretation of what we see at this particular point in time. Mm. I would I would say some things would they would consider more settled than others. Yes, clearly. I think so. Like, like the the the, the shape of the Earth is fairly well no one <laughs> oh, no, no, that's very complicated that. shape <laughs> that's my big problem with these flat earthers any idiot can see that it's lumpy yeah, <laughs> yeah. um i think you're nitpicking brian <laughs> um anyway i think we should uh, move on to the chat um yep. just to settle one thing one mole equals six times 10 to the 23 molecules uh, oh, oh we got pretty close to that yeah all right i knew i knew it was Goodbye. around the 20 right. mark 
Uh, next question is mitochondria, the means by which we can trace ancestry down multiple generations. And um, I, I gave the answer that a mitochondria traces uh, ancestry down the female line. Yep. Uh, look, and I said my bit earlier on, so I'm happy we've dealt with that one. Yep, no worries. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, Brian made... Uh, yeah, I've already mentioned that one too. Uh, sorry? I've already mentioned that one too. Yeah, okay. So we can move on. Uh, you've answered my question about enzymes. Um, now, a comment from Brian. Yeah, right at the very end. Uh, he seems to be very active. Uh, according to the science, the gaps, everything tells us that life only comes from life, that something like this cannot just happen by chance. But since that God implies the existence of God, we have to believe that sometime in the future, science will find a way to explain how it could have happened. I think we've dealt with that anyway, haven't yeah, we? Yeah, we have. Yeah, all right. So we've finished with the chat. So it's open slow Well, I had a um, comment on that. I don't know. I listened to Jane, Dr. James Tua, um, who works on nanomachines and is quite, uh, I think he's a Nobel Prize winner, um, who's, who is um, basically saying that life, we've got absolutely no idea, uh, um, no idea whatsoever uh, about how life originated and he he has five or six uh, or seven um, complaints about the Miller-Urey um, experiment that including chirality yeah mostly about. chirality yeah you but but and that's been debunked by many yeah times. it's not yeah. really regardless but uh, but it's interesting that it's still in the site it's still in university textbooks so it, um yeah, like like um, I've watched a fair bit of James Tour, mm. um, and he, um, unfortunately, I, I I think he he starts. Yeah, I think a lot of people sort of take his arguments apart. Um, like a uh, Professor Dave, the guy on YouTube. He I've watched a lot of him, and he so because I've I've had um live um debates, um. And and yeah, I, yeah. I and 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 James too does avoid a lot of Dave's questions. Um, That's interesting. So you heard something very different. I think this is the one that Reasonable Faith uh, overviewed the recent one with Professor Dave, who I listened to as well. Mm. But but that was a terrible terrible debate. The moderator needed sacking. Yeah, in the first thirty <laughs> yeah. seconds. But, yeah. Um, but but I don't think it. I, it reminded me a lot of uh, when William Lane Craig came and debated um, who's the physicist, uh, Universe from Nothing, uh, that he debated in Australia. Lawrence uh, Krauss. Lawrence Krauss. And it really it really descended into that sort of farce. But that's interesting, Josh. You didn't find James, and that wasn't the best debate. You, you don't find James Tours? Uh, no, I, I find I find this stuff argument? interesting, but... Um... Uh, but he, uh, like he, I, I think he. Well, maybe I just listened to it from the other side, but I, 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 I feel like there's a lot of um, misquotes that he does, and also he doesn't respond to literature that has done study in that exact area. He will just sort of dismiss it without yes. um, commenting. So, oh. it, it, yeah, it's not that I don't agree with what james to um concludes but uh but i don't think his debating is very good because he oh his debating is terrible yeah he just sort of stands there and screams and and tries to draw stuff on but, the, but on the white do you understand board. what he's fighting though he is he's the guy maybe i'm sympathetic towards him i'm working for an for an open source mob at the moment mm. and i've and in fact even when i was working for larry um you know when you say something that's unpopular yeah, um, on bosses or on your peer, it, it becomes very frustrating because you might know what the customers are telling you. You might know exactly <laughs> what the facts are. Yeah, and yeah. Very, very difficult when you're in an environment where people they don't want to engage with what you say or with your arguments. They actually just want to tear you down. Sure, sure, sure. So maybe that's where my sympathies. Maybe mm. that's where my sympathies lie. Maybe I'm associating more with him. Like I, I, yeah. I'd ask. But that's interesting. Is it just his style? What about when you listen to him in discussion? Do you find 
Do you find it more compelling? And, and here, I'm, here yeah. my question is, is about how, not about the content, but actually about uh, what we what we're hearing differently. I'm finding that fascinating. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I suppose I try to. Uh, I, I I listen to his um, presentations and and sort of um, responses to criticism, and then I listen to the opposing side. And yeah, I I don't feel like he's he's always. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe he's just up against some pretty um, skilled debaters. Uh, it's hard to. I've only heard him debate once. The other times I've heard him uh, talking and give evidence, it's, and and it's a bit like um, John Dick. To me, it's a little bit like John Dixon, where John mm. Dixon has a has a few. Um, uh, oh, I'm, I'm just going drawing a mental blank, but he had he has a few challenges out. He one in particular, he said that he'd eat the first page of his Bible if somebody could. Um, mm. give historical references to show, and I can't remember exactly what it was. It wasn't true. That, that Jesus didn't. It wasn't a historical figure. Yeah, I'd some, I reckon it was that. But and James Tour has about seven different things like that, yeah. where he's still waiting on responses. Um, but very difficult in in an area where people are their identities and their and this is actually my day job right at the moment for a for Gates Foundation. Is that I'm, uh, and nobody really knows what I'm doing, so I, I can be I can be a little bit vague, but 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 very very difficult where you've actually measured stuff, you've seen stuff, you know what you know what's actually going on and underneath, but when you try and communicate that, you get um, it shoot the messenger. I don't yeah, think yeah. James Tour, um, don't you think? That that's a really big factor with it. I mean, maybe he's a hot blooded guy in the first place, but 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 but. Uh, well, well I mean, for instance, the, the the live debate that he had with Professor Dave, he was standing at the, the chalkboard and and drew up a few molecules and said, "Show me how you make this from um, a synthetic chemist, you know, uh, process." Um, and uh, and his opponent would say, "Well, I've got." this paper and I've got that paper and I've got these experiments and this experiment and it's all in the literature here and Dave would uh, and um, um, James Tour T James Tour would just say no show me on the talk board or us basically I'm not yeah because believe it. He, he later on he explained that he's he's been over those papers and 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 did you what was it was really but you, you can't you like you can't just like you can't just reproduce an entire paper on a chalkboard just right there, like it. And and um, that's so so that's true. kind. Of, he's he's kind of like it, it. It looks like to the audience that he's just dodging the question. He's saying, "No, if you can't do it on my chalkboard here, then it can't be done," which is 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 just not valid. Not valid. Interesting. You know, you're reminding me of Sam Harris debating. Um, I'll shut up in a minute. Uh, Sam <laughs> Harris debating uh, William Lane Craig. And he was one of the four horsemen that, uh, that yeah, yeah. had the courage to do it on morality. And the way that, um, and because in this interview for everybody else, if you haven't heard it, um, uh, or in this debate, basically um, Professor Dave, who I thought was a fairly laid back sort of guy from his videos, but apparently not. No, he's quite, he's quite fiery. Off. Yeah. He just starts off from the interview was just basically every second line was how James Tour is actually a, a Nobel Prize winning uh, chemist who builds nano machines and nanobots mm -hmm. and, and is looking at, um, uh, you know, uh, and is and, he, and is actually written up in many places as being close to having uh, cures for um, for lots of blood diseases and things like that. And he just starts saying how big a liar he is. He's a liar. He lies about this. The reason we're here is because James Tour is a liar. I came to prove that he's a liar. Mm -hmm. And just like... Really? Yeah, like, I mean, I, needed kicking in the bum. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, um, it, it, he's very opinionated. That's for sure. Like, I, I, I think he's. Anyway, um, uh, thanks, uh, jo uh, for that conversation, Jo. I, I, it's, it's interesting. You heard something different. Um, I might have to listen again. Can I present a completely different perspective on all this creation stuff? Yes. Um, 
because I was born in Alice Springs in mm. the middle of the 85% of Australia's mainland that's arid or semi-arid and grew up in Baptist and free Baptist missions to the Aborigines, having become a high church Anglican now. Um, and what I was interested in was, in retrospect, seeing how the Aborigines took to the story of Genesis when it was told to them um, that they took from the stories what everyone wants to know, who and why. God made it all to make us for relationships and to make a home for us. That's the who and the why. And since the 1700s, we asked two questions that I think the text is not really set up to answer, which is when and how. And if you ask the Aborigines, when did God do all this? Oh, back in the dream time. And how did God do it? They'd look at you as though you're a bit simple and say, only God knows. Um, and from that, and also I saw the big difference between myths and factual stories. Myths are stories that are told to teach meaning, whereas factual stories never give any meaning, value or purpose. And so by looking at all of this and all the arguments, I call myself an ultimate creationist, that whatever the time scale, whatever the mechanisms, God was behind it all and the rest of it, when you look at the sheer complexity of a cell, of an atom of the universe, the rest of it is really rather beyond us. Mm. So, oh, you can't have it on myths. And I think I want to say, well, one of the most amazing huge scale effects on Western society and culture and, and um, human interactions is the Good Samaritan who never existed. A parable is a myth. But look at the enormous power over 2,000 years of the Good Samaritan. Hmm. I think sometimes... Oh, the it's... Aboriginal background bit I might have, might have mentioned is that I provided all the photos for the Stolen Generation trial and I'm in the photos with those children from Tennant Creek because they were my playmates. Mm -hmm. I uh, have to tell you, my um, my daughter-in-law spends her time representing kids up in uh, Bushcourt in Tennant right at the moment, and uh, runs the church, uh, our church, on uh, on Sundays before she spends uh, the rest of her day bailing, uh, bailing kids out in Alice Springs. Wow. So that uh, that resonates me. It's Leonard, right? Leonard still. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that resonates for me, doesn't it? I think some some things that actually occurred really happened can also have meaning. <laughs> oh, so, yes. so, so, yeah, some things can actually serve both functions. And I think that's why the whole Bible is told as a story and not as a, a set of dot points. Because the stories people interpret in all sorts of different ways across your own lifetime and your own experiences and everything else. And um, dot points aren't very comfortable in, comfortable in, comforting in lots of situations in life. But people's stories and interactions and just being with people, persons, is what life is really about. Relationships. I did a talk on the meaning of life a few years ago and uh, that was my ultimate conclusion that the meaning of life boils down to relationships mm -hmm. Roman? Um, um, Fuzzle Rana in an article on the mitochondrial uh, DNA uh, he, he makes a this is his, he makes an interesting statement at the end he says um to say that the origin of the machinery for protein import is a complicated system that somehow evolved is not a scientific explanation for how this complex biochemical system arose. 
it isn't even an evolutionary just so story. Instead, it is precisely what a creation model proponent would say based on what we have learned and continue to learn about protein import into mitochondria. The somehow factor that puzzles some scientists points to the work of an intelligent designer. I thought his point about the it's not a scientific explanation uh, is important because just to say it evolved, it just doesn't, it's not putting it together, you know. That's why I see whether evolution for me has no, has, has so many holes, you know. Science of the gaps. Yeah. Too many, too many holes. Yeah. Mm. But, anyway. Yeah, I mean, that, that, um, that structure is just one of many um, structures. Like, I obviously skipped over all the different, like, I, I tried to sort of, hint at the fact that all of those enzymes even on the glycolysis first stage they've mm -hmm. not only got their active sites where they're sort of you know structured so that they can twist a particular um, molecule in a particular way you know they also have the inhibitors and in the um, you know the regulatory sites on them as well which change their 3D shape in order to make them quicker or slower or just not function at all or whatever. But to me, that is, it's just another, st that's just another whole level of the fact that these regulatory sites as well are all factored in to, to make this process go faster or slower, depending on the cell's needs. Um, it's just sort of like a, you know, you've got a complex shape, which does a complex thing. And then, oh, by the way, you can change that shape a little bit based on what substances are in the nearby area or have bound to it. Um, they just, yeah, and, and that's every single stage along basically is, it's, well, it's not every single stage, but it's um, a good number of the stages along each of these cycles, you know, each of these um, pathways. So it's, it's mind boggling really. Like, it is mind boggling, yeah. And, yeah <laughs> you know, you're talking about, you know, well, probably the Psalms, you know, we're, what is it, beautifully and wonderfully made? Is that what it is? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, by the way, I am um, being a fan of G uh, Chat GPT. I asked the question, is the Miller Urey experiment still relevant? And it came back and said, yes, it is. Uh, and the first point, historical significance. The Miller Urey experiment was groundbreaking. So I want you to listen carefully. Let's see if you agree. Uh, at the time, provided the, providing the first experimental evidence that the building blocks of life, including amino acids, could be synthesized under conditions that mimic er Earth's early atmosphere. What do you think of that statement? I think you need to be very careful about using yeah. GPT for truth statements. <laughs> I think it's false in this one. Um, you could ask it, um, could I be wrong? And it will say yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think the, 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 where it says could be synthesised under conditions that mimic early Earth's atmosphere, I think that's uh, demonstrably wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, it assumed that the, um, the uh, atmospheric composition was dif uh, different from uh, what it actually was. Mm, so I think cool. it is wrong at that point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, having said that, look, I fully agree. You can make amino acids by discharging uh, electrical discharge into a, an organic soup. Easy, no problem. Fully agree with that. Um, but then it's the complexity after that that I find is the issue. Um, we've heard, uh, fully agree that Josh has said, yes, there are some of the right-handed amino acids that are created also go into other parts, but not into the actual structure of the protein. They go somewhere else. So someone had to split the right-handed ones from the left-handed ones, and only the left-handed ones were then chosen to make the proteins. Mm. Yeah. So um, yeah. So I agree with the comment. You have to be careful with what chat GPT tells you. Yeah. Uh, I've got a couple of questions, Josh. Yeah. In the uh, first part, I was quite intrigued with your statistics. The first one being the importance of oxygen and the very fragileness of life if you don't get enough, which yes. people that hold their breath underwater are at high risk 
with some of the figures you gave there. Yeah. Uh, the second question is, with the complex forming of all the required things for life, raises the question about our diet and uh, how oh, yes. important all that is. And the other question, of course, is, um, for example, you know, the old days, people were sentenced to jail to be on bread and water. The question is, how long could you live on just bread and water? In other words, what are the essentials in our diet that, that are key to being healthy and continuing to an old age, given the process that you've described? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not a, a nutritionist by any stretch, um, but um as you can see um all of these uh well although some of them will be one way arrows but a lot of these are linked and so with these carbohydrates for instance and all the stuff that you can extract out of out of something like bread it would it would contribute to a lot of these pathways and and for instance um um your body can't you know so you got fructose you got glucose you got all these different types of starch um all these different types of sugars and everything like that so you, you can get a variety of different um, um variations of the same type of thing and your body can use it so you like th this pathway here just shows how amazingly flexible i suppose in a sense your body can be um when it comes to what you actually put into it but obviously i mean i i you obviously need to be able to still generate. I mean, the, uh, so you've got your hydrocarbons and all that, but you've got plenty of other stuff, which is requires all the other minerals and, and whatnot. So um, I, I don't know the answer to your question, but um, uh, one thing I was trying not to make the assumption is that glucose was the important sugar here because you can take all of these other sugars starch you know starch is just stored glucose but if you eat starch then it just has to break it down through a couple of um metabolic um stages and then you've got your glucose and and um and glucose actually goes through fructose in the um in glycolysis and so if you have fructose then you can just skip out the the first stage or whatever whatever's the case you know so um uh does that make sense like so so i use the the term glucose because that's kind of where it starts but um um that's kind of a a line in the sand because that glucose could have come from starch or something else um you can also break down um, say lipids or nucleotides you can actually break those down to produce ATP as well um, so it's more than just um, glucose for instance you can actually start breaking down extra parts like that and recycling other um, so you're saying oils. Josh that bread will take you a long way well it I'm, 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 saying, I'm saying that your body's very clever and it, it's, it's very good at recycling bits um, and using like based on this chart you know you I, I don't know i'm not a nutritionist so i can't really answer to that so well but um your body is very good at making do with what it's got in my opinion mm. Bread, I, was not bread I was interested in your remarks uh your preface which you which you said as you can see so <laughs> if i put my glasses on and put my nose on the screen Probably the wrong audience. <laughs> well, we can definitely see it. We can't make head nor tail of it, but we can definitely see it. No, the 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 idea of the slide was not to not to um necessarily read it. It was more just to give a feel for for um what you know. Yeah, so um, it's so complex that you can't see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just no, okay. it, it, what what's amazing to me is that people have been able to map this sort of thing out. Yeah and to work these things out you like i mean who you know they're very specific they know that complex um to you know doesn't pump a proton you know i mean these things like you just got to wonder how they even come up with some of you know how do they even discover this sort of thing like to me that's amazing mm. you know yeah how do you look into a mitochondria and, and and understand all that yeah it's beyond me yep Okay, at this point, I think we uh, should uh, terminate the, the recording. Um, uh, so, but before I do, I'd say, Josh, this is very well done. This is your best talk. 
And, um, I, d- I didn't set a very high bar in some of the previous ones. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you don't really well. Yeah, you know, I think this is well presented. So, uh, yes. congratulations, and we appreciate what you've done. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. So, at this point, I'll terminate the recording for the YouTube viewers, but I hope that you all enjoyed it.